Radio, a medium that has been pruned, honed, trimmed, winnowed, chiseled, bonsai, and deposited here today. Ready to be moistened with the watering can of evolutionary jewel? This is the Dennis Miller Show. To the Dennis Miller Show. That's right. Come to me, my babies. Let me quell your pain. Christian Blatt attempting to quell the listener's pain, <laughs> but unsuccessful at quelling the pain for our fearless leader, Mr. Dennis Miller. Under the weather today. We hope he's back tomorrow. In fact, we should be sure he'll be back tomorrow because he's tough. He ain't afraid of no bola. Also not afraid of Ebola, our next guest, Michael Hausam of IJReview.com. Michael, thank you. Thank you very much for finding the time in your busy schedule to always be the person that I call with about an hour's notice saying, hey, I'm hosting the show today. You want to be on? <laughs> well, uh, shalom, aloha. Happy day part to you, Christian. Yes, happy day part to you and aloha, shalom. Michael, on Twitter at MP House, H-A-U-S. And there's so much to talk about. First of all, what about the baseball game we went to a few <laughs> weeks ago? You, myself, Coltrane, and a friend of yours saw the Kansas City Royals who kick off game one of the World Series at home today. Did you feel like you were watching a World Series team manhandle the Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim? Uh, you know, I felt like I was watching a World Series team absolutely and utterly embarrass and destroy a double-A club. <laughs> it was, uh, you know, um, I, I can't say that I was totally on board and behind the Angels' efforts to make it to the World Series. But I don't know, what was it, like the 21st or 22nd inning when we were sitting there and I was saying, you know, I just don't think these guys have the fuel to burn. Yeah, we we talked about this on the Blackcast, the podcast that I do, that I, I think I even said this to you. Yeah, I said this to you, not to Coltrane. I'd never felt that a one nothing game was ever more out of reach for the home team. It was like the fifth <laughs> inning. The Royals were up one to nothing. I'm like, yeah, this ain't happening. There was yeah, some was excitement. Like but how much of the problem was it really that uh, Coltrane refused to support the rally monkey? You know, I'm still actually waking up in the middle of the night shaking about that, thinking, you know, that is, at least for us in Orange County, for us that are Angels fans, that, that is a huge part of the historic success of the ball club. Uh, it's a cultural institution, and we're standing up and yelling and having the greatest of times, and he's sitting there with his arms crossed, whining, crying. I'm like, you know what? What are you even doing here, man? Coltrane, would you like to respond? You have the floor. The rally monkey is the stupidest thing ever. And, I mean, you're saying it's a historical <laughs> tradition? You, mean, back you mean for the last 10 years? Uh, 12. Oh, 12 years. Oh, great. 12 years. It is so stupid. It has no relevance at all to anything. And by the way, which I pointed out at the time and I stand by, you don't rally when you're tied. <laughs> that is the dumbest thing to say. Oh, we need to rally right here. You're tied. It's a tie ball game. You don't bring in the closer in a, in a non-safe situation. You don't bring a rally monkey on when you're tied. Now, as I pointed out to Christian at a, at a previous point, if they had a rally fish, I'd be all for it now. Because they got trout, that would make some sense to me. But a rally monkey has absolutely no relevance. There's, it's not like it's like a theme of Anaheim or something. So forget it. The rally monkey is dumb. <laughs> all right. Well, you know, he really took a firm stand on there. And I think, Michael, we should probably back away. Michael Hausen of IJReview.com. You know, he has a really strong, uh, a really strong opinion about the rally monkey. Another thing that people have very strong opinions about, Obamacare. Now, you wrote just a few days ago that if it's working so well, why are so many people saying what about it? They're saying something about it. Well, they're saying they're not uh, they're not big fans. That's for sure. I mean, the 
the polling shows um, since the law took into effect, there's, it was Gallup just did a recent poll, and it's very interesting. They asked two different questions. They asked a personal question in the sense of, hey, has this helped, hurt, or had no effect on your family? Uh, and the numbers of people that it's hurting continues to rise. The numbers of people that has had no effect has dropped. Um, throughout the last couple of years, especially since the beginning of the year. And then they ask another question, do, they, do you think it's going to be good, bad, or indifferent for the long-term effects of the healthcare industry in the country? And the effects aren't quite as significant there, but it still is increasing the numbers of people that are anticipating that Obamacare is going to hurt healthcare across the country. Now, Michael, you listen to this show. You're a fan of the Dennis Miller Show. You're a member of the DMZ, the premium membership service at DennisMillerRadio.com. So you're fairly well acquainted with how Dennis feels about this. Obamacare, it's in place. It's not working. A lot of people knew that it wouldn't be working. Time to move on. Not really anything we can do about it, right? We just have to go, okay, we thought it was going to be crappy. Look at that. It's crappy. But now you have to go pay your higher premium for care that is sub substandard that you didn't want basically there's there's no real way to to kind of shake shake it up and not have to do this right no not at all i mean the the symbolic effort that ted cruz led last year um was just uh in my opinion just political silliness um uh, until uh conservatives control a Senate and even the White House, all of this other stuff is just a bunch of nonsense. That's the law. And there may be little bits and pieces that have to be trimmed off. Uh, and frankly, most of the trimming off that's being done, bits and pieces, are actually done by the administration itself, oddly enough. Um, but, yeah, it's uh, – as, as Dennis is very fond of saying, which is totally true uh, – it, 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 it's happened. We're already here. It's, it's not, hey, if we're not careful at some point in the future, we're going to whatever. Uh, that some point in the future has already come and gone, and um, it's done. It's, the, the cake is baked. It's a great point. We're talking to Michael Hausam of IJReview.com, and Michael's been kind enough to say that he'll stay with us for another segment when we'll talk about more frustrating things around Washington. <laughs> Uh, we've got a couple of uh, calls on hold. They've been on hold for a very long time, 25 minutes actually. So I feel that I would be remiss in my duty as substitute host to let someone stay on hold that long and not take it. So we'll very quickly go to Ron in Iowa on line one. Ron, welcome to the Dennis Miller Show. Well, thank you, Christian. I have to say you're my favorite guest host on that show, by the way. And I, I apologize for taking this to a more serious point. But I think I have the, the solution for the Washington football team's name problem. Well, go ahead and tell us what it is, Ron. Well, well, you know, we always name our football teams over people we respect, over our heroes and stuff. You know, the tenacity of, and, and fighting spirit of the, of the Indian, American Indian we, with the, the Vikings' power and ferocity. And uh, all of our heroes have changed in the last few years. Uh, I think we need to change the way we look at things, too. Maybe maybe they should be the Washington victims. Well, it's not a bad suggestion. I mean, it's obviously something that's a little too serious and, you know, something that I can't even make light of it in any way. It's too serious, but it's also too serious for a team to actually embrace that sort of thing because they don't want it to represent anything like that. But I think that we could all agree that those are the real heroes, you know, people that we could stand up for and be proud of, not RG3. In any case, I'm Christian Blatt. This is the Dennis Miller Show. We will continue with Michael Hausam of IJReview.com right after this. Welcome back to the Dennis Miller Show. Dennis Miller, not available. So I would hesitate to call myself the next best thing, but I'm the thing. I'm the next thing. 
next best thing. Would never call myself that. Christian Blatt sitting in for Dennis Miller with the very generous, kind, caring Michael Hausam of IJReview.com on Twitter at MP House H A U S. Michael, thank you for sticking around for another segment. I appreciate it. Hey, I'm happy to do it. And you know what? I'm I'm completely comfortable calling you the very next best thing, Christian. I don't know. Well, I needed somebody else to do it. I felt like it was a little too self-serving, and I didn't want to do it myself. So thank you for taking the bait. Obviously, I am the next best thing. In fact, I might even say I'm the best thing. In any case, I know that, uh, you know, look, hey, we've all got a bowl of fever. And not the good way. Well, not the literal way. We don't actually have the fever caused by Ebola. But people are really worried about it. I'm sure that every Halloween party is going to have a couple of people in hazmat suits. Hysterical. But people are literally hysterical about it, and it's a very real concern. And I think it's fair to say that there's different levels, but everyone is concerned about Ebola, except the director of the CDC, who advised against a travel ban from Ebola-stricken countries in West Africa. And why was that, Michael? Uh, Well, you know, it's funny, man. I I saw that article, and sometimes when when stuff comes across either my Twitter or Facebook or, you know, whatever social media feed, I really try to make sure that it's not from The Onion or from The Daily Current or one of those fake news sites, uh, because... Uh, so often the news nowadays is so crazy nuts uh, that it's it's easier to assume that it's parody. So what what happened is uh, Representative Murphy from Pennsylvania was on the phone with this CDC guy, and they were having a conversation about the travel ban. And it, it just seems like common sense. If people are dying at an unbelievably high percentage rate from a disease that there's no solution for, there's no way to stop it, uh, you know, a common sense would be, well, let's go ahead and stop those people from coming in the country, first of all, right? Of course. That's very common sense. Seems like, yeah, 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 let's do that for a little while. Let's see how that works. Sure. Exactly. If uh, when we were going to that Angel game a couple weeks ago, if I said, oh, by the way, I have an unbelievably bad flu, uh, everybody that comes into contact with me gets it. Uh, uh, By the way, what time are we supposed to meet at the box office? You can say, hey, you know what we're going to go ahead and do is um, reschedule, please. You're not going to want me next to you. (laughs) <laughs> it's true. I would have even I, if you were flu stricken and contagious. I would have rather gone with Larry O'Connor. That's how bad it would have been. Fortunately, right. that didn't happen. We didn't have to deal with that at all. But right. it's a great point. Yeah, if someone's sick, they should stay home. Now, if their home is in bed watching TV, that's fine. If their home is oh, I don't know, Liberia, they should probably stay there too. Right. Well, what the what this guy Frieden said is that the administration had a concern that by limiting travel uh, to and from, banning travel from West Africa, that that would have a negative economic impact on the region. Uh, and therefore, the administration was quite hesitant at enacting some sort of ban. In effect, saying that, hey, uh, the few dollars – that make their way into the West African economy, that trumps the health and safety and security of all of those of us here in the United States. So we should be more worried about the economy of West Africa than the health of the American people. Is that what the CDC director, maybe not literally, but is that in essence what he's saying? Uh, Yes, that is, in essence, what he said. Now, what was quite interesting is later that day, uh, Frieden was on the Hill giving testimony before Congress, and the fellow Murphy asked him the question, basically just, hey, reconfirming the phone conversation we had. I just want to make sure this is what you said to me, right? And then the guy really, really, really waffled and wouldn't come out and, you know, repeat the statement he had said. Because obviously, under the light of day, in front of congressional testimony, I mean, the percentage of Americans whose heads would explode at the idea of allowing Ebola-stricken potential people into the country in order to save 
the economy of Liberia, which I would say the gross domestic product of your life and my life exceeds that of Liberia. <laughs> most, most Americans' heads would absolutely explode if they actually thought about that. Well, someone whose head is about to explode is actually calling in on the other hotline. You didn't even know we had two hotlines. Uh, we have friend of the show, friend of Michael Hausam, friend of myself, Mr. Larry O'Connor. Larry, welcome to the Christian Blatt Show. I mean, the Dennis Miller Show. I, I feel so terrible, Christian. Please, I am on my knees begging for your forgiveness. I apologize. I must have missed the email where you asked me to, <laughs> to fill in for Dennis today, and I, you know how busy I can be. But you know that I drop everything to be <laughs> here for the dentist. So I, I feel terrible. I really do. Oh, my God. Well, Larry. Uh, I have so much to talk about. Too. It's actually myself who, who should uh, feel terrible, although I don't. But I will apologize. I actually didn't ask you. I had such short notice. I decided, you know what? I'm up to this. I'm going to put myself in. I'm going to be oh, player manager oh. and well, host. Well, you know what? In that case, I'm so sorry because oftentimes that has happened in the past, uh, Christian. And so often, usually you then send me. Uh, instant message or text message or an email saying, hey, last second, I got to fill in for Dennis, but can you come and do a couple of guest spots with me? Can you, can you be a guest for half an hour? And clearly I missed that message too. And I am so, so, so sorry. Oh my God. Well, please you, forgive me. You know, Larry, again, embarrassing. Uh, you know, I, I didn't ask you to be a guest because I'm actually on with Michael Hausam right now during this segment. I'm sorry, who? Michael Hausam from IJReview.com. <laughs> oh, well, I know IJReview.com. It's uh, really one of the finest websites on the Internet right now for a clearinghouse of news and information. And, you know, great stories that people love to talk about and share on Facebook and just, you know, drives the narrative, I think, for conservative people right to center. Uh, how's them unfamiliar? With, uh, <laughs> not, uh, well, is he on right now? He's on right now, yeah. And we only have about 30 seconds. Hello, my brother. Well, hi, Terry. How are you? <laughs> I'm I'm so proud of you, Michael. I really am. I I couldn't be more proud. I, I hope you're you're doing well. Well, look, Larry. We're also very proud of you. We know that you're too big time for us. You're on your way to Fox right now. So if anybody's watching Fox News, they'll see Larry on any second with Gretchen, and you can follow Larry on Twitter at Larry O'Connor. Larry, thank you so much, Michael. You don't even know this, but I'm going to keep you for another segment because we have so much more to talk about. More with Michael Hausam of IJReview.com. Special thanks to Larry O'Connor. I'm Christian Blatt. This is the Dennis Miller Show. This is the Dennis Miller. Welcome back to the Dennis Miller Show. Christian Blatt sitting in for Dennis today, to whom we wish a speedy recovery. Still with us, not knowing that he would still be with us. But he was strong-armed into it. Michael Hausam of IJReview.com, on Twitter at MP House. Mike, Matt, and Kurt, all stay on the line. I will get to your calls. But we have very important business to handle with Michael. We have a couple more stories I wanted to get to, but that Terry O'Connor, did you say that was his name? I don't know that guy. Is he a friend of yours? Uh, you know what? Uh, there's a Larry O'Connor that's... He's friend adjacent to me. Oh, sure. Like, uh, I was with my young girls last night. We were talking about this weekend going to see uh, Alexander and the horrible, very good, no bad day. Sure. Whatever it's called. And they had met Larry and his four kids a few weeks ago. So we're driving down the road. I said, well, maybe we should get some friends. And they said, oh, well, we should have Mr. O'Connor come because he's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> wow. There's a real deep-seated rivalry between the two of you, and I'm happy to cultivate it here on the Dennis Miller Show. But in the meantime, let's talk about how a socialist group has called for a $20 minimum wage. And since I kind of make minimum wage, I can't say I'm entirely opposed to it. I feel like there's problems, but I'd be okay to make $20 an hour. But uh, talk a little bit about the Freedom Socialist Party. Oh, my gosh, man. This this story just made me howl. Yeah, so it's uh, surprisingly enough, it's a group based in Seattle, Washington, called the Freedom Socialist Party. And you can just picture 
the tie-dye hemp clothing, the Birkenstocks, the custom-made bongs that are filling their offices, right? <laughs> of course, yes. <laughs> uh, your dwelling granola uh, munchers. So uh, one of their big things is uh, increasing the minimum wage, and they're calling for a $20 an hour minimum wage. Uh, going to their website, which is a joy uh, to just look at all of these different editorials, and they're, they've been very involved in the various different things going on up in Washington for raising the minimum wage, uh, involved here in Los Angeles, involved in San Diego, San Francisco, Sacramento, all of them calling for an increased minimum wage, uh, which all, depending on which cities they are or even the state of California, range from 13 to $15 an hour. But they're also very clear uh, that they would prefer a $20 an hour minimum wage, and they give a bunch of reasons for it. I mean, they're, they're kind of rabid, foaming at the mouth, income equality, uh, businesses make too much money, and it needs to be given back to the people price, right? Yeah, I think we all, we all probably know two or three of these people in our lives, sure. <laughs> well, depending on uh, where we are, if we happen to be cruising down Santa Monica, that's all the people that we know. <laughs> yes, very true. Right, right. Um, so, in any event, I, I I found that to be entertaining. But somebody had found, like I couldn't figure out who initially found it because the story was all over the place. But they had posted on Craigslist an advertisement for a job opening that they have. It was a web content manager doing graphic design. Um, you know, marketing stuff for them. And there's a pretty extensive list of qualifications. Uh, but the thing that killed me is that they're offering a $13 an hour wage for this job. <laughs> sure. So the organization that thinks that everyone should make $20 an hour is only offering $13 an hour, not even the $15 an hour that other groups have, you know, that seems to be the amount that most groups are saying, you know, I've seen signs that are, you know, 15 now, and 15 is the settled. So they're even lowballing that end of it. They're like, well, yeah, we think it should be 20, but we shouldn't even have to pay 15. Well, exactly, and that, that was the, the couple of thoughts that came to my mind looking at it is, number one, where they reside in the city of Seattle if the effort that they are behind, if the effort that they are actively campaigning for to get Seattle to go up to a $15 an hour wage, they immediately would have to raise the price <laughs> of the, you know, raise the wage of the job they're offering, which I thought was very funny. Um, but on, on a more serious note, what it does to me is it, it uh, a lot of this progressive lefty approach is very much of a do as we say, not as we do. Right. Because it's, it is not hard for me to imagine that as much as they're passionately embracing hopeful, idealistic, unicorn-chasing uh, economic wage theory, the reality is, is that somebody there, I, I would guess, somebody has a checkbook, and they sit down and they figure out, okay, we have this opening, we have this need to expand our message. However, when we punch the calculator up and do the pencil and do the math and all that kind of thing, it turns out that given our budget, given the amount of money we have, we can only afford a certain dollar wage per hour, which means that even to me, even the most extremely crazy economic folks are constrained by reality. And I just thought, I, I found that to be a beautiful juxtaposition of the reality of the marketplace and the world we live in colliding with, you know, hopeful, idealistic, non existent economic theory. Yeah, no, no. It's it's a lot easier to be idealistic and have very strong feelings on what people should be making until you actually have a payroll department of your own. Then all of a sudden, you know, when you actually have books that you're keeping, you're like, oh, well, you know, not us, though. Anyway, we're talking to Michael Hausam of IJReview.com, and I wanted to get in one more story, something that we haven't addressed yet. Uh, the Supreme Court, over the weekend, a very rare weekend ruling, they'll allow Texas's voter identification law to remain in effect, in effect for the November election just a few weeks away. Talk about how not everyone is happy about this. Uh, yeah, well, it's, it's one of these things that the, the predictable responses have occurred exactly as you would expect. So what happened is um, 
the state of Texas put in this voter identification law. And it, when you get into the weeds and the details of the law itself, uh, you know, there's a handful of different identifications that, will, that they will accept. Uh, some of those identifications are actually no cost whatsoever. And it's, it's basically just a way to make sure that if somebody shows up to pull a lever, that they are who they say they are, right? Like, for example, in the uh, country of Mexico, nobody is allowed to vote without being able to officially identify who they are. So uh, despite kind of hue and cry about it, the law, it actually does make some sense. Well, quickly, a federal judge struck their law down, and then within a couple of days after that, an appeals court set aside that ruling, and then a Supreme Court on Saturday released an opinion allowing it to stand. So it's unlike the typical arguments in front of the Supreme Court, months and months and months of comments and deliberation, and a and then a final decision being made, this, this whole thing start to finish happened in about a week and a half, okay? Yeah. So, um, the, the, not that it's a huge big controversy, but uh, Justice Ginsburg released a statement saying that it is a huge threat to public confidence, that it's purposefully discriminatory, that it's unconstitutional, and she objected. The NAACP came out and said the same thing, that it is an obstacle course designed to discourage voting, that Texas is trying to keep black and Hispanic voters from going to the polls, et cetera. Uh, but, I mean, just, just like any of these discussions, you know, if, if you're hearing this on your cell phone, if you're drinking an adult beverage while you're listening, if you're filling out a welfare request form at the same time, planning to get married, buying an M-rated video game, giving blood, purchasing cigarettes, I mean, the list of things that you could be doing, all of which require some sort of identification, Correct. literally is pages long. Yeah, and, you know, I, I look, I've heard the reasons why voter ID laws are bad, and historically I can see reasons why. It's hard to say unilaterally, oh, yeah, they're a terrible idea. I know that there's plenty of debate, and I'm sure you hear both sides of it, but the people of Texas want to try it out, let's just say. The, and, you know, of all the things that we should know in this world, don't mess with Texas, you know? And I'd actually like to hear from our listeners in, in Texas. We have many of them. Give us a call at 866-509-RANT, 866-509-7268, and let us know if you feel better about these midterm elections, knowing that there will be the voter ID law in place. And also give us a call if you think it's a terrible idea. But, uh, Michael, I appreciate you uh, talking about this and so many other topics with us. Uh, you're always a good friend to the show. I think I've now had you on when I've guest hosted maybe four times, and you've still never been on the black cast. How does this happen? Uh, you know what? Uh, it was weird. Uh, the details of the restraining order that I got <laughs> said, <laughs> I'm just kidding. I don't know, man. I'll, maybe what we could do is you could send me an invite, and then I could take the time to consider a response, and we could go from there. All right, and we'll do it all on Twitter under the hashtag baloney sauce. Michael Hausam of IJReview.com, we really appreciate your time.